Hello, my name is Joel Z. Williams and welcome to Prop Scale Model Aircraft Building Club. Um, a couple things I want to show you today. I want to show you a quick primer on some tools that I've recently acquired that I think I wish somebody would have told me about this when I first started. The first thing I can think about are these alligator clips with uh, bamboo, uh, I guess you would say lances and, and so they have like a little rubber coating. You place the alligator clip on top of here, jam it into there and then you fit your alligator clip holder uh, over it, your little plastic housing over it. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Ah. Suffice it to say, it winds up looking something like this. And this works out really great, especially if you have a Tamiya um, base turntable, something you can put in there like that. It makes it easy to spray when you're um, airbrushing. Okay, something else I wanted to show people is I always wear gloves whenever I get started on, on a project, whenever a bottle. This is a new package, so forgive me if it takes me a while. But I'm the kind of guy who doesn't like to show up to work the next day with a whole bunch of paint residue on my hands. And for that reason, you can buy a pack of rubber gloves, uh, really inexpensive, probably about $10 for a hundred pair, uh, which, you know, of course, it makes it really easy to clean up. And this is important, and I think a lot of people kind of skip this point, this part when they, when they start working on aircraft models, is you're dealing with a lot of chemicals and a lot of materials that would be hazardous uh, under normal conditions. You would not want to work uh, on, a, on a continuous basis in something like that. And for that reason, I also recommend that you go ahead and get a respirator. Now, you don't have to spend a lot of money. This is a 3M respirator. Uh, that has you know like a lot of extra safety built into it. I do it because I just don't like the smell of paint thinner and you're going to need paint thinner to, to do anything if you're spraying enamels with airbrush. Now let's go ahead and get started with the airbrush. I wanted to show you a couple of tricks that I do. This is the typical airbrush setup that I use this is a uh, gravity fed dual action airbrush and now what that means is that when you put paint in the cap gravity is going to pull it down into the, the brush and it's dual action meaning you can push down and get air out of it but until you pull back that's when you're going to get your um, spray of the medium okay and I've got this set very low um, this air compressor type is of such a nature that you can set the air compressor um, between 15 and 20 psi and that's generally what you're going to use I have this one rigged out I don't know if you can see it but I have it rigged where you can it's also an airbrush holder uh, primarily let me move that primarily I use my Iwata brand um, this is a bin uh, uh, component that I spent about 20 bucks for this essentially will let you spray into it and and not cause a lot of trouble there I'm not going to wear the respirator tonight because I want to go ahead and show you um, how to load and clean this brush uh, what I'm going to be using here is some gloss black this is um, testers model gloss black not very uh, enamel this is something that you can find in any hobby store uh, in America okay and what I do is I have went ahead and got essentially a cocktail mixer and I love these things because they allow you to get up in here and mix up this paint the right way from the bottom up you don't have to worry about uh, your paint not being mixed properly you're gonna go ahead and, and, and get that really mixed up so I'm going to show you a lot of different techniques here really quickly, but you can use this video uh, again and again, and you can see this video at any time. And it's going to—I'm going to show you some really quick techniques on how to deal with enamel 
uh, painting with the airbrush. Now, with the enamel, the difference between acrylic and enamel is enamel is uh, essentially a, a oil-based in nature. So in order to cut it, clean it, reduce it, you're gonna need some paint thinner. And I don't like the smell of paint thinner. Paint thinner smells to me like gasoline. So I usually use a respirator when I'm doing this, but the point I'm trying to make here is that enamel is one of those substances that adheres very well to uh, plastic and especially, uh, and, it, and it sticks. It's very uh, hard to remove enamel once you get it on there. And that's good because you're gonna, uh, in, in aircraft model building, you're gonna put a lot of other colors on top of colors. And you don't want the, t the color that you put on top to have a bad reaction with the base coat. And that's why enamels or oil-based paints work better for that particular application. They just adhere a little bit more solidly to the underlying um, uh, plastic. So I use, I'm using a little pipette here, probably filling it about, this, is, this plastic device is called a pipette. I'm probably gonna suck up, maybe, well, I'm probably gonna get about fifth of a milliliter, uh, 0.5 milliliters in there. I'm gonna put it right into my cap of my um, double action gravity fed. And uh, the way I work is I always use these pipettes multiple times. So I keep my basic colors pipettes around because you know there's no sense in getting a brand new one if you're gonna spray black. Uh, there's no sense of, uh, in getting a brand new pipette. pipette. So once you have that on, uh, what we're going to do is thin this down. Now, the thinner, with, with enamel-based paint, you want your thickness to be about the consistency of milk. That's what we're looking for. So what I'll do is I'll use this dropper, and, you, and you'll notice I use an apothecary-type uh, paint thinner uh, dropper. A paint thinner comes in a can, of course, but I like to be very precise about my application of it. I don't think you, that you need to add a whole bunch at a time. And I think with the dropper, it allows you to be a little bit more precise about how much you use. Then I just use a couple of toothpicks, maybe one, maybe two, it doesn't matter. But I like to mix it up in the cup. And I like to see about what consistency I'm dealing with there. Like I said, what your ultimate goal is you want it to be about the consistency of milk. And then you take a test shot, you're going to shoot on some paper or something that you don't mind to get uh, a little bit of paint on. And you want to kind of see how it's spraying. If, if you got a lot of spurt action going on, if it's spurting, if there's a lot of material kind of coagul coagulating, then you know you got a little bit too thick. And in this particular case, I think we've got it just a wee bit too thick. So what I'll do is I'll just add a couple drops, and it's always better to err on the side of caution and put too little in than too much, because you can always reduce it later. And then I'll just mix it up. Until I have what I think is a good flowing medium. All right here, this is too thick. And you can see, well I can tell just from experience that this is too thick, and it's not flowing correctly. So my next, my next step is if I have good consistency here, and I think that's about the consistency of milk, I'm gonna check my needle. I'm gonna break this down, and I'm gonna figure out what the problem is. And I'm gonna remove my chuck here from the back, and I wanna see that needle. Pull that needle out, oh, there's the problem. There's some paint residue from the prior spray that I, I failed to get off when I first uh, to clean the gun yesterday. So what I'm gonna do to clean that needle off is I'm gonna take me a little wee drop of paint thinner and get my paper towel saturated with it and I'm gonna clean it. Now it doesn't seem like that much residue would prevent the flow out of this gun but you'll be surprised. Just a little bit of residue hangover from the last paint application can really affect your spraying. And 95% of all airbrush, and I'm gonna say that again, I'm gonna repeat it for the record. 
95% of all airbrush complaints stem with improper or poor cleaning. You gotta clean these things and you have to clean them after, look at how much, look how much easier that's flowing out of there. Look, look at that. That's how it's advertised. That's how you should get your flow. That's what you wanna see. Okay, now, uh, on this particular model, it's calling for a little bit of aircraft shading within the canopy. Now, if I was going to teach a master class, I would show you how to reduce this paint until you got it to the point where it would just barely come out and you would draw shaded lines here and do, do all kinds of crafty work. That's not really necessary on this type of model. On this type of aircraft model, uh, it's just important to get this interior a little bit dark and you want to try to make, make it match with the, uh, the cockpit. So that's essentially what you're going to do there. On a later class, we'll get into shading and doing all that really important work. Really, really uh, meticulous work. But here we're just concerned about getting some paint on that cockpit area and and uh, making it look good. Now, uh, one thing is I always rec that I always notice whenever I, I start painting is there's all kinds of parts that I have forgotten to paint. And one of the things I wanted to show you here in this lecture is a new device, a new toy, I should say, that I, that I bought, per recently purchased that I think will make your painting experience a little easier. Um, a lot of people uh, write to my site and they complain about wheels. And they say, well, how do we get good detail? I look at the, the professionals and I look at their models and their wheels are just so perfect. I recently got a hold of this device. Now this is a, a device from a company called Everline. And one of the things I think is really cool with it is it has a blade and a compass. That's the central setup of it. And if you, I'll just use this piece of paper here. Uh, normally I would use a piece of tape or something like that. But if it's set right now for um, roughly 10 millimeters. So if you set your point down into the paper and then you use this uh, twisting action to cut the paper, this probably will not be a good example. Let me. Let's go ahead and get a piece of tape. This is to me a 40 millimeter tape here. Of course, I have gloves on and I'm on the clock, so it's not going to cooperate like it would normally cooperate. Let's get a big, thick piece of uh, tape off of there. Jiminy Christmas. Come on. Okay, there we go. Alright, okay, so this is that, to me, a 40 millimeter taper. And what we're going to do, we're going to set that just down on a regular piece of paper towel and then use the compass. First, you want to set your point, you want to, you know, kind of dig your point into that and make it grip. And then you want to just spin. Of course, I. Normally you would have this thing taped off where it wouldn't move. It's not showing a very good example. Alright, let's try it here. We'll just try it on this this piece of paper. Okay. And this happens to be I think it was set for 10 millimeters. Uh, of course, that will change depending on what you're working on. But as you can see, we got essentially a perfect hole, perfect circle here. And if you're trying to get those perfect circles on your on your wheels, um, a tool like this is indispensable in getting the tape. Of course, none of this is working out. 
If I wasn't filming, it would be working perfectly, magically. You would be like, oh my god, look how perfect that circle is. Alright, here's a little closer. And it just shows you, I'm wearing gloves. Normally I wouldn't be wearing gloves on that. But that just gives you an idea. See, you can mask that tire off and you can get just a perfect circle on that bad boy. So that's a cool tool to have. That's a, a, a latest addition. One thing that I do recommend, if you do use this, make sure that you cap it because it has that, that sharp blade there and you can really easily cut yourself if you're reaching for other tools. So go ahead and, and uh, put the safety cap back on it when you're done using it. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, let me just show you a little bit more uh, paint action here. Um, one of the things I, I, I like to show new, new people to modeling is just how easy it is uh, when you're mo when you're doing scale model um, airbrushing. One of the, the big worries that I see rookies is they're like, well, how do I how do I con control my flow and how do I know I'm doing it right? How do you, well, it comes with practice, and some of the things that you're going to learn is that the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. It's it's just like any endeavor. If if you do it a lot. Uh, if you if you practice with it and you and you're not worried about the outcome, you just give it a shot, see see how it works out on paper, and 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 you know invent and and be inventive, you know be creative. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do, but. Uh, you know, it just takes practice and it takes a lot of time, you know, anything worthwhile takes time. So that's what I, I'd like to show you, but I also, the, the main purpose of this video is I want to show people how to clean these guns. I get a lot of calls from people who are frustrated with airbrushing and they say, you know, I bought an airbrush and it stopped working for me and I'm never going to use an airbrush again. I'm, I'm moving away from the airbrush. The airbrush is a, a waste of my time. Um, okay, all right, but then when I tell them about my 95% theory, they shut up and I go, 95% of every airbrush problem results around not prop, the prop, not properly cleaning it, not getting it properly prepared, and when you get through spraying and enamel, you need to know how to break this gun down and you need to know how to clean it, and when I say you need to know how to clean it. The best thing I can tell you is for every five minutes of spraying that you're gonna do, you're gonna probably do about 10 minutes worth of cleaning. So for every color change, especially dark colors, you're gonna spend about 10 minutes